I, I don't title the messages, I just don't, but they have to be titled for, uh, for um, online purposes and, and stuff like that. So if I had to title this one, this would be called Hypocrite or Legitimate. And I want to go right to Yeshua's words in Matthew 7. He only had one sermon, and this is towards the end of his sermon, and it's verses 15 through 20. And it says, beware of false prophets, of the false prophets. So they were already around. By the way, we know they were around in the first century. In, in fact, they were around right before then. Balaam was a false prophet. They've always been around. Evil has been around since the beginning of time. There's nothing new under the sun. It's just really worse. Why? Because in this day, they were obvious. Today, they're, they're not so obvious. I tell people all the time, look, this is the deal. When I go to other countries, you know, you can have guns pulled on you. I had guns pulled on me in Kenya because their government is so incredibly corrupt. Our government is more corrupt. We just do it professionally. Right. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes. Beware of the false prophets. Not of false prophets. Of their around. They come to you wearing sheep's clothing. But underneath, they are hungry wolves. You know, there's a lot of sayings from the Bible that people say in the world. You know, live by the sword and all these kinds of things. You know, the good Samaritan. Isn't it amazing? They don't like God, but they're speaking his word. They come to you wearing sheep's clothing, but underneath, they are hungry wolves. Exclamation point. You will recognize them by their fruit. And then, and then I, you know... I know that Paul was brilliant and an intellect, and of course Yeshua could have been an intellect, but he chose not to be. And Paul's letters are very obscure. Most people that try to understand Paul's letters, they, they probably do more damage than good, because you'd have, to, you'd have to study and do a word study on the Greek like never before. And, and we know he's hard to understand, because we hear people preach him out of context all the time and just destroy him and destroy the rest of the word. And we know that for a fact, because Peter says Paul is hard to understand in his letter. He states that in the Bible. And he says many people destroy his letters as they do the rest of the word of God because they're unstable. They just don't study. You got to, you know, if you really want to understand it, I'm not trying to be a big shot. You've got to daily study it. You can't just grab like Galatians 2.20 and think you're going to know what it means. I mean, do you know who the Galatians are? Do you know what was going on in their congregation? Do you know when the letter was written? Where was he when he wrote it? Did he visit them? Is he writing back on a visitation? Is something going on there that he's responding to? Are you kidding me? Then he, he says, you know, Yeshua spoke that to five-year-olds, to common people, too, uneducated. So he asked rhetorical questions, meaning the answer is obvious. It's inherent. Can people pick grapes from thorn bushes? I mean, you can ask a three-year-old, can I pick a grape from that thorn bush? No. Obviously. What about figs from thistles? No. Likewise, every healthy tree produces good fruit, but a poor tree produces bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot produce bad fruit, or a poor tree, good fruit. Is this like kindergarten? People can't handle this today. They need something a little bit more intellectually stimulating. <laughs> Any tree that does not produce good fruit, this is where it gets hairy. It's cut down, thrown in the fire. Yeah, I didn't say it, he did. Right. So you will recognize them by their fruit. Now, looking at this first word, beware, he, he said it a lot of times. He said it all over the Gospels, beware, beware. In fact, in Matthew 24, the section in 25, it's, they broke it up in chapters, but Yeshua didn't. There's 97 verses. When they asked him, how are we going to know about the end days? Tell us about it. You know, and if he didn't want anybody to know, he would have said, it's not for you to know. But he went into 97 verses, and he didn't speak a lot. He only gave 1,800 sentences. And most of it is, is similar in the different Gospels, synoptics seen through the same eyes. So he said about 600 sentences. So if he's going to take 100 sentences, which is almost 15% of what he said, you know, it's going to, he's going to make a count. It's going to have a punch. So he says right out of the gate in Matthew 24, before he goes into any detail, he says, don't let anybody deceive you, meaning they're going to try to deceive you. You don't tell anybody wear a jacket, it's cold outside, if it's not cold outside. So he wouldn't have said, don't let anybody deceive you, if they're not going to try to deceive you. The devil, by his very name, is the deceiver of the brethren. And all his demons follow suit. So just think about that. Deception is rampant. It's coming. It's coming for me. It's coming for you. It's coming for everybody. Don't be paranoid. Will you relax? 
just relax. He gives, he gives a way out, always. The Lord doesn't want you behind the eight ball. He doesn't want you duped no more than you want your kids duped. That's why you teach them about things. So it's beware. It means to pay attention to or to avoid, okay? How many people are as old as me? Older, okay. Have it your way. You're old. Good. Okay, you remember back in the 60s, 70s, Lost in Space? Okay, and what was the big saying from Lost in Space, the robot used to say? Look at some of you. You are old. You ain't going to get a kid to watch that. Go home, get, pull that up on YouTube, and let, let your kid watch that. He will slap you with the graphics. It is so, like, awful. But, but he warned him because he loved Will. And whenever there was impending danger, see, it's too late once it grabs you. See, we, we react to things. We have to be preemptive. We have to be prophylactic a little bit. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. A pound. So, like, you ever see these signs, danger, high voltage? What does that tell you? Okay, some of you go to the beach. I lived on the beach. You, you're familiar with rip currents. Rip currents are just created by sand shifts, undercurrent wind, sand shifts, and it creates gullies, so you get pulled out. What do people always do? They try to swim in. Listen, just to save your life, because a lot of people drown from this, when you're at the beach, your kids are at the beach, don't ever try to swim against the rip current. Ever. Let it pull you out. Relax. Rabbi, I can't do that. Yes, because you're going to panic, which most people do in life. Don't panic, because the minute you start swimming, trying to swim against the rip current, you're going to get tired. You're going to start sucking in water, and you're going to drown. You're going to drown. Let it pull you out of the rip current. Once it pulls you out, it takes you away from the rip current, and then swim at a 45-degree angle to shore, or doggy paddle, and you'll get to shore. It'll take a little longer, but that's how you save your life. When Bernard and I were in Israel in 1989, we went down to Masada, and they had signs, danger, quicksand. Remember what I did? I was crazy, and I always want to experience anything, jumping out of a plane, whatever. I want to do it, so I wanted to feel what it's like to go into quicksand. Hey, all I know is, no, 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 here's one better for you, sweet pea. I asked you to hold my hand, so if you knew what was coming, you should have let me go. That wasn't my hand to hold. Yeah. You were holding on to something else, it wasn't me. Okay, good to know, but I'm here. Anyway. It said danger quicksand, and it roped it off, which don't go in there, right? Danger. Well, this is what the Lord's saying. He's just giving us a warning. You know why? Because people that give warnings love people. When, when people are trying to teach you and speak truth to you, even though he'll lose or she'll lose friends or lose face or lose reputation, they love you. And people that watch you go in the quicksand, they could care less about you. And people that tell you everything nice could care less. They are, they are suck. They, they're, coming at, they're coming to get you. They're going to use you, man. Woe to you when everybody speaks well of you. I didn't say that. Yeshua did. Luke 6, 26. Woe to you when everybody speaks well of you. Rabbi, everybody speaks well of me. Woe to you. Now, some of you, nobody speaks well of you. That's a whole other story. <laughs> That's not because you're sharing the gospel under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's because you've been baptized in pickle juice or something. That's, like a, that's not a wolf in sheep's clothing. That's a sheep in wolf's clothing. You ever meet them? Yeah, they're, they're, supposedly they're saved. But man, you wouldn't know it by the way they conduct themselves. They'll tell you things like this. All I know is Jesus lives in my heart. That Jesus needs to be exercised. So, he's telling us to be aware, be careful, avoid danger, danger, false prophets. Who are these false prophets? Just look up the word. We'll find out who they are. One who is acting the part of a divinely inspired prophet. They are acting like a prophet. They are walking in that quote-unquote office, uttering falsehoods under the name of the divine prophecies. In other words, they're speaking by demonic influence. 
And it says you'll know them by their fruit. Okay, let's look at that word, karpos. It means the fruit of trees, obviously. We're not talking about that. Metaphorically, symbolically, you'll know them by their works, their actions, and their deeds. That's how you'll figure it out. Matthew 24, I told you this section where Yeshua is warning us and telling us about the end days. I just have two verses. It says, for there will appear false, there will appear false messiahs and false prophets. There will, it's guaranteed. And they will perform great miracles. What? Rabbi, we were in the charismaniac movement. Listen to me. The word of faith movement, totally demonic. Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn. And let me call out another one, Frederick Price. It was totally demonic and unscriptural, period. They followed a guy named Kenyon who followed a guy named Wimby, and they were mesmerizers and magicians, and they got duped. So if some of you are still operating in that, get the heck out. It's not true. People that plead the blood of Jesus, it's not in the Bible. You want to talk about the blood of Jesus? Then be crucified with Jesus and let him live through you. No such thing as pleading the blood. Rabbi, I did that. Great. It was part of a charismaniac movement, which isn't biblical. Rabbi, why do you call these things out? I don't know. Do you tell your kids to look out for pedophiles? Yes. Why? Do you tell your kids when they're crossing the street to look both ways for cars? Yes. Why? Do you tell your wife when she's on the side of the road, don't just let any stranger come up? Do you tell your kids to look for ID? Do you don't you tell, why are you doing this? Because there's bad guys out there. Why do you think cops carry guns? Because there's bad guys. And they're protecting you from their bad guys. So if I call things out, I'm trying to protect you from bad guys. By the way, that's what a spiritual leader is supposed to do. An under-shepherd. Yeshua did it. And as an under-shepherd of Yeshua... You guys are maybe under shepherds. Maybe you have a ministry. Maybe you have a family. That's your job. Make no mistake. They will perform great miracles. But I was on the impression that a miracle meant, right, they'll do amazing things. So as to fool even the chosen, that's the believer. Yeshua is saying that the believers will be, will be fooled by false prophets and false teachers and false preachers doing amazing things. And then he goes, there, I've told you in advance, I've told you, I love you, I've warned you, I've told you, now it's on you. Them are some heavy words. You don't hear this stuff no more. Doesn't sell seats. Yeshua is saying that not all miracles are from God. Miracles indicate supernatural power, but not necessarily divine power. Don't we know this? Did, did not Pharaoh's magicians? Guys, it's right there in the Bible. It's not even like, Rabbi, where are you getting this from? Right out of the gate. And right out of the gate from the beginning of time, Satan's trying to deceive Adam and Eve. Right out of the gate. You think he stopped his MO? He hasn't changed. He's the same old devil. Now let me preempt this by saying that I am not exempt from being deceived. Nor am I exempt from deceiving. You better test the spirits. Amen. Who would say that? Me. I would say that because it's true, and I like truth. The truth will set you free. Some of you are a little bound, and I'm talking about needing more fiber in your diet, okay? You need truth to set you free. You can't be operating in things that somebody told you that have no biblical reference. It's very dangerous for you and everybody you come in contact with. 
Look at 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. You could read these things at home and then read it in the context and everything. I'm trying to give you as much context as I give you in the short time we have together. The fact is, it's a fact, that such men are pseudo-emissaries. They're, they're false apostles. They tell lies about their work and masquerade. They masquerade as emissaries of the Messiah. There is nothing surprising in that. He's saying, you should not be surprised at what I'm saying. Paul is saying to them, you should not be surprised at what I'm saying. For the adversary himself, Satan, masquerades as an angel of light. If he does it, his workers are going to do it. So it's no great thing if his work is... I think this is so simplistic. It doesn't get more simplistic than this. So it's no great thing if his work is masquerade as servants of righteousness. They will meet their end that their deeds deserve. Make no mistake, God is a just God. You, you don't have to play judge. So in other words, Paul is saying that these people are impersonators. Now, some see Satan how, especially kids, as some horned, evil-looking, red creature with a tail carrying a pitchfork, right? That's the way they want you to see it, the world. Just like the world wants you to see angels like at Bed Bath & Beyond. Every time a person sees an angel, they poop their pants. No ball babies with wings is making me poop. But you're getting your theology from the world. Satan, is, listen to me. Satan is never more satanic than when he's carrying a Bible. Rabbi, you're putting yourself out there, and I'm putting you out there too. You're not exempt. So how do the agents of Satan pose? As atheists? No. You keep attacking the world, and, and Yeshua is talking to his disciples. The world is the world by its nature. What do you expect? Oh, the world is so, what? Water is so wet. Do they, do they pose as infidels? As false teachers? No. They pose as ministers of righteousness. And false prophets are greedy for power, gain, and self. They always point you to them. As opposed to being a humble servant. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to go out on a limb here. How old is Mother Brown now? 102? I met her when she was a, a mere babe. I think it, she was 88? 88. 88. Met her at 88. You know Mother Brown. If, if you don't, you, you should get to know her. Um, she came to our synagogue. I think, uh, I think she had a drug problem because you drug her there, Rose, I believe. <laughs> and she came to the synagogue. And we had an oneg. It was at, when we were at, we were at for a year at uh, Emmanuel. Then a year we were in that, in the East Macon, right? Remember? God's house. Who knew God's house was so hot? Listen, there was no air conditioning. It was about 118 degrees in there, right? People, I thought nobody would come. More people came. They brought fans. Remember? Fans. The only thing I wasn't down with was the Hawaiian shirts that a lot of them were in that. I just don't like Hawaiian shirts. But anyway, that has nothing to do with it. That has nothing to do with it. Somebody's watched from Hawaii, I know. It has nothing to do with Hawaiians. Just your shirts, son, I don't like. <laughs> um, so Mother Brown comes, and we have an own egg. Now, she's 88. And it's, not, it's, it's, it's the way my parents raised me. If you're on a bus, and that's all I took was buses and trains, if a woman gets on, you give it a seat. You never let a child. Are you kidding me? If I would have sat in the seat, I would have got my head knocked out. My father would have knocked me out. Then when I woke up, a stranger on the train would have knocked me out. <laughs> And then my father would have knocked me out again for making a stranger knock me out. Those were the good old days. There was no defects. They were good days. So we got all this food. And I see this woman, this old woman standing. Now the Torah says take care of the gray-headed, but come on. Do you really need when it's on your heart? Do you really need to go over the Torah? This person needs help. Should I help them? Seriously? 
If you got a check with the Torah, you're messed up. It's not on your heart. Yeah. It's messed up. So I look at her. She has no, she has no, she's not even sitting. So I go up to her. I put my hands on her shoulders. And I said, Mother Brown, here, here's a seat. She sits down. With my hand on one shoulder, I said, um, what can I get you to eat? She starts crying. And I'm like, dang, I blew another southern thing. <laughs> Once again, you know, they told me when I first moved in, I yelled, Jeremy. They go, you can't yell in the supermarket. I go, why not? <laughs> it's not proper. I said, oh, it's proper for me. <laughs> and when he hears me yell, watch how quick he comes. He'll come faster than your dog. Watch this. So I'm thinking, oh, golly, this is like the worst day. I made this poor old lady cry. Go over to Rose. I said, your mom's crying. I don't know what I did. I, I emphatically apologize, but please let me know what I did so I can apologize right so I never do it again. And she goes over and talks to Mother Brown. She comes back to me. She goes, Rabbi, that's not it. You don't understand. Go back and ask her. So I went back and I said, what? I'm so sorry. You know when you're trying to do something so right and you're so happy and it goes so wrong? Anybody experience that? Yes. It just goes 180 to the other direction and you're like, and, and sometimes some of you do this on a regular basis. So you ask yourself and God, why can't I do anything right? Of course, you're you. That's why. No, that's not why. Because sometimes things go like that. So Mother Brown looks at me and goes, I've been going to church. <laughs> Her granddaughter said she walked in the house. <laughs> no, she didn't possess my body, but this, this is what she said. She goes, I've been going to church my whole life, and ain't never a pastor ever asked me what I want to eat. I've been serving pastor all my life, and I looked and I said, I am so sorry that your pastor never read the Bible. Yeshua came to serve where does he get off being served? I mean, am I stupid? I mean, I must be stupid to read this book and believe what it says. I'm as stupid as my friends in Kenya. I'm as stupid as my... You're too smart. You're too educated. You're, you're not stupid enough. That's your problem. You're spending so much time analyzing the book that you can't live the book. I'm like, what are you serving? It's okay if you want to ask him what he wants, but he should be asking you what you want. You've been around a lot longer. You're a lady. You're an old lady. The Bible says, take care of the gray-headed. Where are you getting off sitting your big fat butt on the chair waiting for her to serve you? Yeah, ask, ask your mom if she knows who that pastor was. I, I, you know what? When I finished with him, he just got served. Okay, so getting back to what we were doing, how do we identify them? It makes no sense for, for us to just go, well, there's false prophets, go eat. And it's easy. It says in 1 John 4, 1, it says, Dear friends, beautiful, this, 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 this disciple, this apostle was so loving. He loved people. He said, don't trust every spirit. Yeah. On the contrary. Now, some of you, listen to me, some of you are so messed up. You're so, you're so like conspiracy out that you have no discernment at all. So you know what you do? You trust no one. And you know what that leads you? A prison. Amen. A prison in your own mind and heart. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying live in a cave. That's what Elijah did. It didn't work out. He's saying on the contrary. Now, some of you trust me so much. Test, I tell you every week. If it ain't in the Bible, talk to me. On the contrary, test the spirits. Test them to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone, this is first century, they've gone, they're already out. They're out. In full regalia, they're out there. So he's saying, test it, 
examine it, and then prove it. The unseen spiritual influences that guides people's speech and actions can be tested by observing their doctrine and their conduct, as well as by the gift that you supposedly have of spiritual discernment. Now, the world, even the body of Messiah today, especially in America, have a hard time with this verse. You know why? You're judging me. You're judging me. You bet your butt I'm judging you. You're right. When we do a background check, have you been busted for messing around with kids? You think I'm going to let you teach? A couple of people, they split right away because I said, look, I can't, I can't tell you you're not forgiven. Of course you're forgiven. Everybody's forgiven. You made that forgiveness, but you still might have some issues. So I'll be watching. And so will some of my friends. Well, I'm not comfortable with that. Okay. If you've got nothing to hide, then you should be comfortable with it. But if you're not comfortable with it, you just sent up your red flag, so bye-bye. Rabbi, you're crazy. I'm not crazy. You're crazy, dude. It says be innocent as a dove. It means don't sin, but be shrewd as a viper. You forgot that part. Look at Matthew 7, 1. Right back to, right back to Yeshua. Right back to Yeshua. Right back to Yeshua's one and only sermon. This is what they do. They say, don't judge. Even Christians, don't judge so that you won't be judged. Anybody ever heard that? You just, you just spoke it. You just spoke it. We live in a world today that cries out, tolerance! Listen, if you are my age and you watch that cheesy Lost in Space, then you also know that we used to use the word tolerance, but it was always negative. When I was a kid, it's like, we're not going to tolerate that. We're not going to tolerate that. We're not going to tolerate that. Zero tolerance for that. Zero tolerance. I'm not going to tolerate that. I'm not going to tolerate that. I'm not. Today, it's, we're going to tolerate that. We're gonna, you have to tolerate that. You have, don't you see what the enemy has done? And don't you see how he's infiltrated the church? Somebody saw the scriptures I say and said, Rabbi, I'm praying for you because I know that you're going to expose certain things and I know the enemy is not going to be happy. Tolerance is a doctrine. It's a doctrine. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of life. And it teaches permissiveness and open-mindedness. It says you need to be a little bit more open-minded. Right? What did Yeshua say about taking a wide road? And many will find it. Some of you have found it. Eureka. I love Jesus. Sure you do. As long as, he, and listen to me, sin and joy don't cohabitate. People today want their sin and they want their Savior. Don't judge so they, they t- out of context. Okay, this is synonymous. Tolerance is synonymous with leniency. Tolerance is synonymous with liberalism. And tolerance is synonymous with liberality. Live and let live. They're not hurting me. The saying you're judging me is so grossly overused. Some of you even use it. Man, you don't even know what you're talking about. He just said discern. So what does it mean? Matthew 7, 1 forbids pronouncing another person guilty before God. Look up the word, crino. I don't have a right to tell you. About judgment belongs to the Lord. But I have a right to check you up and down spiritually. I will spiritually x-ray you if you're going to do something here. However, even though you're not entitled to declare a person guilty before God, Yeshua never intended that we abandon our critical factory faculty of discernment. This is a gift he's given us, housed by the Holy Spirit. This spirit 
helps us discern. When we choose somebody to work in ministry, we have to discern. If our daughters or sons are going to marry somebody, we have to discern. If you're going to take a wife or a husband, we got to discern. These are all gifts of discernment. It's all over the Bible. About different times, we must apply the gift of discernment. Look at what we, we just read in Matthew 7, 15, 20. Just go back to that first slide for a second, real quick. Real quick. Real quick. No? First slide? The first... The first slide, D. I said the first slide. Can we go back to the first? Thank you. Might want to lay off that cough syrup, sweet pea. Okay. Right here, it's asking us to discern. If he's telling us to beware, obviously we have to know. We have to discern. How are we going to know if we don't use discernment? So right out of the gate, he's telling us we have to judge the doctrinal teaching of teachers and preachers by the word of God. We judge these teachers and preachers, what they're saying, according to the word of God, not according to their dreams and visions. Man, it's crazy. And you'll go with a dream that is anti-biblical, not even extra-biblical, and you'll go with it because some jerk who you think is a prophet is telling you about this dream. And he's collecting money for what? Where's his orphanages? No, he doesn't. He works for a non-profit organization, all right. Go to John 7, 24, so you'll see that there are apparent discrepancies in the Bible. Right? He's, Yeshua says, I came to bring peace, not a sword. Then he says, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. So you've got to see where it is, in what context, and what's he saying. There are 969 apparent discrepancies in the Bible. Look right here in John. So he says, don't judge lest you be judged. And then in John he says, stop judging by surface appearances. Judge. So he's saying here to judge. Matthew 7, don't judge. Because this isn't about declaring somebody guilty. In this context, Yeshua is telling disciples, you've got to judge. Just judge with the right judgment. Some of you are trigger happy. You know who you are. You judge by surface opinions all the time. Look at the way he's dressed. He must not be a man of God. What does his clothes have to do with anything? Try to accumulate all the facts. There's two sides to every story, and then there's the truth. A lot of times there's extenuating circumstances. Get the backstory. Do you know the backstory about what went on? No. You, so you came, you told, you don't know what's going on for 15 years. Don't just come to conclusions based on external appearances. Don't be too quick on the trigger because if you're too quick on your trigger, God just might be too quick on his. And you know how, how slow he is to anger. You know Look at Yeshua, stabbed and kicked and punched and crucified. And in the midst of it all, he relents. He holds back. Yeah. I could call on a legion of angels, 6,000 macho men, to burn your eyes out in your sockets. Yeah. But instead, I'm going to go after this robber who deserves it on the cross, and I'm going to make sure my mother's taken care of. Yeah. Crazy, right? Do you know the number one complaint that non-believers or non-churchgoers have as to why they want nothing to do with God or us for that matter? Hypocrisy. And we go along and say something stupid like, well, just come to our church because we got room for one more hypocrite. A hypocrite, is not a, a hypocrite is not a good word. If you knew your Bible, you'd know it wasn't. You think a hypocrite, or some of you might think, I shouldn't say what you think. I don't know what you think, but I can tell you that some believers think that a hypocrite is just kind of a nominal Christian. They're saved, they're born again, they just don't live it out all the time. Look, none of us live it out perfectly all the time. That's a given. 
Some of you, you know, you get angry over the littlest things. Sometimes you could yell at your wife and sound like a, a mean ogre. And if somebody saw that, they would never buy your witness. Never in a million years. Nobody's 100%. Nobody's perfect. Everybody gets up on the wrong side of the bed. Everybody has troubles. Everybody has trials. That's why he says, I am, and you're not. But a hypocrite is not a good thing. We think a hypocrite is just, like I said, a nominal believer, somebody... Oh, no. Let's go back to Yeshua. Okay? Matthew 6. Where are we? Back to his one and only sermon. If you ever want to study anything, Matthew 5 to 7. Priceless. Three verses in Matthew 6. It says, so when you do tzedakah, that's charity, giving, don't announce it with trumpets to win people's praise. Like the hypocrites in the synagogues and on the streets. Yes, I tell you, they have their reward already. Meaning, they're not going to get a reward in the afterlife. They got what they wanted. They wanted the applause of men. We want the applause of heaven. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to stand praying in the synagogues. By the way, he also goes into being wordy. I've sat in some meetings where the prayer was a dang sermon. How long do you need to pray? You just want to hear yourself talk. What is the matter with you? Here's a good prayer that Moses did. Lord, heal her. What are you talking about all this stuff? Lord, we know you're the great healer. Dude, he could do it. He doesn't need all those words. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that people can see them. Yes, I tell you, they have their reward already. Now, when you fast... Don't go around looking miserable. You know those folks, right? Oh, I haven't eaten in three days. I'm fasting, suffering for the Lord. Like the hypocrites, they make sour faces so that people will know they are fasting. I tell you, they have their reward right now. If you read this on the surface, it just looks like, okay, they believe is they just need some fine-tuning, and we all do, Right? So God forbid we say anything negative, because we all, Rabbi, are you saying that you got it all together? I, I've said it many times that I don't. I don't know how many more times I can, okay? And I've also said you shouldn't be looking at me anyway. It has nothing to do with me. Today, theology has become meology. I've never pointed you to me, and I never will. And if you are looking at me, you're messed up, because I ain't looking at you. I'm looking at him. Look at the word hypocrite. It's not good. Don't tell them, come along. We got room for another hypocrite. Like, you're a hypocrite. If you're a hypocrite, you need to fix it. A hypocrite is an actor. It's a stage play. It's a pretender. A hypocrite's a phony. The word came from the Greek actors who wore different masks to portray various roles. Yeshua criticizes the religious leaders. Now, he criticizes them in here for a particular kind of hypocrisy. Namely, doing the right things for the wrong reasons. Yes, their motive, which I don't know your motive, and guess what? You don't know mine. That's the beauty of it, but God does. God knows the motivations of our heart. Matthew 23 is an incredible section. Depending on what manuscript you read, there's either seven or eight woes. Okay? Yeshua basically is, I don't know how to say it nicely, lacing into the religious leaders of his time. These, these were the pastors and preachers and teachers of his day. And I just have one woe for you because it, it takes a long time, but you really should read this section. It's absolutely stunning. In my Bible, this is the sixth woe. In your Bible, it might be the seventh woe. Like I said, most manuscripts add a little section that I don't think was really part of it. It says, woe to you hypocritical teachers, Torah teachers and perishing Pharisees. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look fine on the outside, but inside are full of dead people's bones and all kinds of rottenness. Likewise, you appear from the outside to be good and honest, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Can you imagine hearing that from him? You know, they're the big shots. Who are you? You know, you're from Nazareth. Nazareth is the hood. What good can come out of Nazareth? Read about Nazareth, you'll find out why I say that. Like, come on, you're not even from Jerusalem. You haven't been schooled. You didn't go to our schools. You didn't go to our seminaries. Who taught you? Huh. 
a woe is not a good thing. It's not like, you know, you're on a horse and you're just asking it to slow down. That's not this woe. A woe is, a, is a, an exclamation of intense grief, distress, and lamentation, a mourning for what's to come on those people. In other words, Yeshua's heart is broken for them. He's not poking fun. He's not lambasting them. He's acting in a role of a prophet. Now, prophets speak for God, but he's the prophet. He speaks as God. There's a difference. And in that office, he is trying to get them to repent because he loves them, and he's so concerned of their soul. Not poking fun like some do today. This woe concerns with something called, the, theologically, externalism. Externalism. And it's a fancy word. But what was going on is the religious leaders were showing this religiosity and this morality on the outside. But their hearts. Their hearts. You know, back in that day, they, they painted the tombs white. They whitewashed them. Because, of course, there was no lights. And at night, if you touched a tomb, you were unclean for seven days. So they highlighted that, and that's what he's saying. He was comparing them to the tombs. He's saying, on the outside, you look great, but inside, you're dead. Spiritually, you're dead. And it was, it was rough to hear. Look at these words, rottenness. It means physical uncleanness, which means ceremonial uncleanness, which means you have to have a mikvah. But he's dealing with this word in a moral sense. He's saying they're so lustful for luxury. That's all they want. And more and more, can't get enough of it. In other words, they're really taking care of themselves. Just, you, you got to understand something, guys, and I'm sure you do, so I'm not trying to tell you something that you don't know. But I'm here to tell you that there's something very different between our person and our personality. I, I don't, I'm not on Facebook. I don't have time because I have to put my face in his book. I'm not knocking it per se, but what I'm concerned about is that how much time you spend on Facebook versus how much time you spend in his book. Amen. Something's radically wrong, okay? I was told to go on Twitter. They said Twitter would be perfect for you because it's just short things, and I put out things after my meditation time, things that God tells me that I would think encourage people, and it seems to be doing a really good job, but it takes me a minute, less. Once I finish, less, boom, I don't, and it's over. So I don't have to occupy myself with it. I know there's other social sites, but this is the problem with social media. Social media is depicting people's personalities, not their person. And because they're struggling trying to put forth this personality that's not real, and they know their real person, it's depressing them. Because they're showing themselves as something they're not, and they can't deal with who they really are. And it's not working well. More and more teenagers are, are, are depressed, and the suicide rate is just out of control right now. Just out of control. Now, you need to know spiritually that your person and your personality is different. We tend, especially in church settings, to emphasize our personality, what we want others to think we are. God emphasizes our person, what we really are. Now, I know you just can't bring it all out you know, because that would be a little much. But hiding it all, it's not good. See, because if you, if, you don't, if you don't bring it to the surface, God can't heal you. He's not going to go deep in your soul if you don't invite him. He won't. It says in, in, in Revelation 3, and he's speaking to the believers, people use it applicably to share the gospel, but it wasn't an evangelistic call. He says, I stand at the door of your heart. He's speaking to the church at Laodicea, the church, which means he's speaking to us. And he says, I stand there and I knock. If you'll let me in, he won't, he won't dive into your soul and go for it. He won't because that's not loving. That's not gentlemanlike. He's not a home invader. So if we don't really come clean with who we are, he won't be able to heal us. I mean, you're talking about the Messiah, yes. 
You're talking about the Son of God. You're talking about the one who is part of the Godhead. God who came in human form, right? Yes. And, and, and he took on flesh and tabernacle among us. You're talking about the one who received the Spirit without measure. That one couldn't perform many miracles in Nazareth. Right. What does that tell you? That's unbelievable, isn't it? How could he not perform miracles? Because you know what they said? We're good, man. We don't need you. You know what some of you say? We're good. You think you are? Are you serious? You know how deceived, you know how self-deceived you are? That's crazy. You think you're holy because you don't eat pork and you don't do nothing on Shabbat? You think that makes you holy? You think that's what God's going to be impressed with? <laughs> is, that, is that part of the thing? Yeah, but it's a small part. You think that's the greatest? How are you treating other people? You taking care of people? That's the least. It's important, but it's the least. He says that these religious leaders were, were hypocrites. The word is dissimulation. I know. Who, know. who understands that? That's what's in the lexicon, but let me break it down for you. Take a look at the word hypocrisy. Dissimulate, to conceal one's true motives and thoughts, to pretend. Yeah. To pretend. And he says they're lawless. Look at the word lawless. Anomia, where we get the word anemia, some of you doctors, you know anemia is a lack of, of red blood cells in the blood, so it's not oxygenated right, and it's, it's, it's killing you. When you have anomia, it's spiritually killing you. It's, it's, it's lacking. It's the condition of without law. It's contempt for the law. Not just violation, but contempt. Look at Matthew 24, back to that. This is the parable of the wise and evil servant. And you know what? This might be overload for you. I feel it. So I'm pretty much going to stop soon. Because it, it's a lot to digest. Um, I wish we were back in the first century, you know? You know, when I was in Africa and I'd preach, I'd preach into midnight, one in the morning, in a mud hut. I preached in India in a hut. It held 55 people. This thing was not built for more than about five. You ain't never seen anything like it. This is the parable of the wise and evil servant. It says, if the servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is taking his time. He's, our master's away. He's left the building. Yes. It's not Yeshua who lives in your heart. It's the Holy Spirit. Yes. Yeshua's at the right hand of the Father. I don't want to be technical, but he's away, but he's coming back. If that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is taking his time, and he starts beating up his fellow servants and spends his time eating and drinking with drunkards, then his master will come on a day the servant does not expect, at a time he doesn't know, and he will cut him in two and put him with the hypocrites. Now, when I read this the first time years ago, you got to understand He's saying the hypocrites are going to be cut in two. So when you say to somebody, come and join the hypocrites, that's not good. Because if you're a hypocrite, you're outside the kingdom. So now you have to be careful of the words you use because Satan's telling you, oh, it's not so terrible being a hypocrite. There's so many. The Bible says that hypocrites are going to hell. So what Satan's saying and what God is saying are two different things. Where people will wail and grind. Now, what do we know about a place where people wail and grind their teeth? It's not good. It's not heavenly. So a servant manifests his true character by how he behaves when his master's not around. You know, when the parents are in the house, you know, but when the cat's away. Yeah. It, it, um, The, the behavior of this servant is showing that he's a false disciple. He's a hypocrite. Let me tell you something. This is crazy. I remember one time I was sitting in a restaurant, you know, in, in Macon. You know how Macon is, like, unbelievably segregated? Yes. Have you ever seen it? Yes. Yeah. You know, you, there's so many different segregations, it's unbelievable. Just unbelievable. Um, in fact, yesterday I was at getting some fish 
and there's nobody in this store, and I didn't realize somebody's behind me, and I know everybody there. Rabbi, hey, hug them, pray for them, the believers pray with them, the non-believers try to witness, and then I, re- I was just talking for like about a minute. I was telling them, no, I, I said there was a lady there. Are you following the story, or are you out to lunch? Somebody was behind me, but I was talking to the lady who was helping me with the fish. And um, then I, I was telling her about, she asked me about one of my kids, and I was telling her. And then I looked at the lady, and I said, I'm sorry, you don't need to hear about my kid. You know, you're probably thinking, I don't want to hear about my kid. I just want to get my fish. I apologize. I said, you must be from Macon. And she said, yeah, how do you know? I said, because if you were from New York, you would have tapped me on the shoulder and said, look, buddy, talk on your own time. <laughs> This isn't a coffee shop, it's a fish store, I want my fish. And seriously, they would say that. They would say that, okay? But I said, you're from Macon, you're not gonna say anything, but when you get in your car. You're gonna make a phone call and say, I can't believe there was this man from New York City in front of me talking about his child, I could care less about my child, I just want my tilapia. But then, then you're going to go higher than the blood of Jesus because you want to repent. So you're going to say, bless his heart. And you're exonerated. She wasn't happy, but she said, you're right. At least she was honest. It's nice to come clean. It's nice to be real. It's nice to get back to God and be real with one another. I got so much more to tell you. We got we to gotta talk about what it is to be a real disciple and how to get a hold of the Holy Spirit because we cannot be, be empowered. It's, listen, some of you are trying to do this without the Holy Spirit. If you could do it without the Holy Spirit, then you wouldn't need the Lord. Right. You follow because the Holy Spirit comes through Yeshua. Yeah. He connects you with God. You're the lamp. God's the power source, and he's the cord. And if that cord isn't connected, and if, if it's not flowing, you won't get it. And you will try to do what God has asked you to do within your own power, you will fail miserably. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And in this society we live in, with the amount of frustration, with the lack of respect, with the level of incompetence, with customer service being an absolute oxymoron, or just the people in customer service being morons. <laughs> with all this frustration, with seeing how the world's changing so rapidly, seeing how people are pumping us with tolerance and telling us to coexist, making us look like the bad guys, we get frustrated, right? And then this Christian is at the store and he's like, you're dead, you're dead, you're definitely dead. You lose it without the power of the Holy Spirit. Not power to speak in tongues, not power to do somersaults, not power to be loud. Power to love those who don't really deserve it. We desperately have to be the change that we want to see in others. And I'm here to tell you, it is impossible without the Holy Spirit, and it's tough enough with it. Because when it comes upon you and it says, put the gun back in the holster. Put it back. Shut your mouth. You're going to say something that's going to be so disturbing, and you're not going to be able to take it back. Words hurt. Don't do it. Don't go there. Don't bite the fruit. Don't take the bait. You're going to need so much power from the Holy Spirit to defer. We'll get into more of that next week. All right? There'll be another week. If not, if if I get taken away before next week, it's all over your Bible. You can read about it. I'm not giving you anything. I'm not getting any revelation from some mountain or some guru or some prophet. It's right in the Bible. 
So you got the scriptures, get yourself more into 1 Corinthians and Galatians 5 especially, and we'll get into Romans 12 and, and we'll finish this up, okay? If you don't mind, I just think we have enough to chew on. You have plenty of studies. People always ask me, Rabbi, I want to be discipled. You just were. And if I were you, I'd study. Samuel, when he watches these things, he fasts. He fasts and prays, and he sits there with a book, and he gets out his Bible, and he, gets his, and he, he works it. He wants to understand it more. So some of you want to be spoon-fed with another service. That's, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. If you really want to study, it's there for you. Amen. You just need to make the time. You follow what I'm saying? It was like, remember, I'll never forget this. Remember when that girl came to me? We had a, a synagogue in Ormond Beach, and... You know, we always got the people from other churches that needed counseling or needed understanding about eschatology, but they never came to Beth Judah. They just came to me to talk, you know what I mean? And then they were like, ah, that was so revealing. Then they go back to whatever. But it was fine because we were doing it for the glory of God. But not Dorothy. No, that's that's another story. That's a crazy story. No, remember the girl with the dog that slept at our house with the dog? Remember her? She said, my brother, he's he's addicted. He's addicted. He, I know you can get to him. I know you can talk to him. I know you can, Rabbi, get through. So I said, okay, how about Tuesday? And she goes, he bowls on Tuesday. <laughs> Let's stand together. <laughs> Hallelujah. We'll tell you the Dorothy story maybe next week. That's unbelievable. You won't believe it. Okay, guys, uh, yeah, get, get, get a hold of the Holy Spirit. Life is very short. Eternity is very long, but eternity is taken care of for you. You're already on an eternal plane. Okay, you're on an infinite plane, but this time is very short. Your life here on earth is very short. Make it count. Make it count. And uh, be careful. You know, we could tame, tame lions and tigers, but this tongue of ours. It's a mess. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you his peace in the name of the principle of peace, Yeshua. Yivarecha Adonai v'yishmarecha Yo'er anoi pono v'lecha v'hunecha Yisa Adonai pono v'lecha V'yasem lecha Shalom. I love you guys. Shabbat shalom.